So we've come to the question <laughs> where we had you think for a bit. So we will give you um, different years in the past and uh, we'll ask you to share an important fem memory from each of it. So um, the first year would be 2000. In 2000 was when I left uh, what I feel is the greatest job I've ever had uh, as a writer and editor at The Source magazine. And I had just done five years of that was my alma mater. I never went to college and I do not encourage everyone to take this approach. My alma mater, my college years were spent at The Source magazine, um, really documenting the culture from top to bottom. Um, I had to listen to every album release during that time period to find the lyrics of the month, the fat tape, uh, the mixtapes, you know, uh, extract album cuts to turn into the section called the fat tape, coast to coast where photographers would send over uh, photos of events throughout the country. That's how everyone got their information on hip hop. It wasn't so freely available the way it is now. So I knew the role that I played uh, in that regard, um, r ranking the albums at the time when an album got mics, it meant everything. If we gave you five mics, it was a classic. It was rare, but if you got those five mics, people were gonna go out. You got a platinum album, basically. If you got three and a half, you got a gold album. Like We knew how much power those mics had. Um, and in 2000s, when I was just burnt out, I'd done so much writing, so much, you know, I was like, I really wanna do something different. And I jumped into the executive side of the business. That opportunity came to me via Paul Rosenberg and Eminem, when by that time had established Shady Records. So I started my, I made my jump into the label side in 2000. Uh, yeah, I remember. Wow. And the next year, 2005. 2005. It's a time that I look at, I look back at with appreciation and regret, uh, because I feel that was a very quote unquote that was a hot year. I was like, you know, I was involved. I was in the thick of a lot of really active things, um, a lot of really prominent projects. And I don't know that I paid as much attention to the things that mattered as I should have. And, um, you know, that was part of the beginning of the dark period. But before you know it, you're like, wait, what just happened? We were hot. Now things are not, you know, what, you know, and, and, and 2005 was also a time for me to flex my creative bones a little bit with outside ventures. Um, as I had mentioned before with the Monday Night Fight Club uh, and little things like that, I managed producers here and there uh, as well. But um, 2005 was a very pivotal eye-opener of a time period for me in my career. Where it's like, dude, wake the fuck up. Like, you're not going to get another chance like this again. And if you are, you better really maximize it to the next level the way most smart people would have done. Um, definitely didn't have the... I'm such a creative I'm such, you know, my mind is creative first, but I didn't have my business sense as sharp as I should have during that time period. So that's 2005. How about 2010? And 2010 was the tail end of the, uh, of the dark period, which I had mentioned before. It was an opportunity for me to showcase how good I am um, as an A&R. Um, and, you know, I played a significant role in, in Eminem's album with Recovery. Um, and also with the follow-up album, The Bad Meets Evil. So a lot of the ideas that didn't make it on, um, on recovery ended up being a really awesome small project called Bad Meets Evil with Royster 59 and with Eminem. Um, you know, I, you know, some of the, the more significant moment, I never knew what it was like to have, I knew what it was like to be involved with and standing next to a hit. I never knew what it was like to put together a hit and, um, you know, in 2009, uh, I had asked a friend, I'm looking for somebody who's a little bit on the left side, but doesn't go over people's heads. I get that philosophy from the outcast, by the way. They're the standard. Like to me, outcast did it better than anyone in rap history where you can go outside the box, go left without going over people's heads. Um, and this person uh, introduced me to uh, uh, Alex the Kid. And Alex the Kid was this really talented uh, producer from out of the UK. And you could hear his UK sensibilities. His sonics were, they were heavy, almost borderline industrial. But there was a lot going on. It's a little messy, but in a good way. And um, she, being Jessica Rivera over at, uh, at the time, Universal Publishing, uh, introduces me to him. I had to chase him because he was kind of elusive. 
you know, I had a great conversation with him when I finally got him and told him what some of the things we were looking to do. And uh, a couple of days later, based off that conversation, I gave him like a uh, look, if you can stay within this tempo, if you can kind of minimize things a little bit, you know, um, let me hear what you got. And he sent me three pretty awesome ideas. The biggest one ended up being Love the Way You Lie uh, with, uh, with the Skylar Gray reference on it. And um, that right there, that's, it's a billion seller. It, no, it's not a billion. Um, it's a diamond single. Um, it's, the, it's probably the first, hopefully, more uh, diamond uh, song I've ever been involved in. And just to be part of that, which has a... Uh, when a song resonates with a generation, that's special. That's one of the more rewarding parts of this whole thing. Getting a win on the board is cool, but when you put together, when you're involved in a project that resonates with a generation, that to me is super rewarding and fulfilling, which is funny because it has a lot to do with the next year, um, which is... 2015. <laughs> in 2015, I was um, fortunate enough to be involved with the... Uh, with producing the original Broadway cast album for Hamilton, uh, the Hamilton Broadway musical. Um, and that, you know, that was fulfilling in more ways than I can ever describe. Um, it broke so many boundaries beyond just on the Broadway side, cool, but I'm proud to say it's the only Broadway cast album that ever sat number one on the rap charts. And for someone like me who's looking to just accomplish new things, that was one of them. Um, I think from a fulfillment standpoint, as somebody who's big on music education, I think that project covered so many grounds. Uh, it covered history, uh, it covered art, it covered hip hop, it covers his social studies, all kinds of things. And um, to see it succeed beyond expectations is pretty awesome. Even more so, it wasn't something that was getting the full on support because again, cast albums don't sell. I got this idea, I wanna get the roots involved, the roots don't sell. So I've got everything going against me except, fuck, I knew the first 20 seconds in hearing and seeing this, it's like, this is going to be very important and this is awesome. Like, this is going to have an effect on my children and the children of today in a really positive way, even if it doesn't, you know, do the numbers that it's done. And it's done some pretty significant numbers. I'm proud to say it's on its way to seven times platinum. Um, we have 16 gold and platinum records off that project. It's obviously made a, a groundbreaking uh, uh, statement in the Broadway field. We hope that it opens up more uh, plays about, you know, with a hip hop sensibility to it and more musicals that have some sort of hip hop texture to it. And um, yeah, 2015 was when that took place. Over the course of this these years, um well, as you're involved in these artists, like important moments, whether it's a comeback or a breakout or rise to fame, whatever it may be, um, as someone that's involved in the business side, does that put any pressure on you or put any stress on you as the, being the in that moment? Side of it? Yeah, as as like as you're involved in an artist, like an important moment in their careers. Well, you have to focus on the moment. Period. You have to focus on the task at hand, or what the challenge is, or what the account. Look, everybody, this is the business. Hits. We want hits. We need hits. We don't want cool. We don't want, if that cool turns into a hit, great. But we want hits. In this day and age, I don't know that you can determine what a hit is, if I can be honest. I think the public decides what the hit is. And the hit comes from, a different, from different areas now. What we think is obvious, oh, this sounds like a hit. If it doesn't have the right resources and the right momentum attached to it, I don't know that it's going to end up living to the expectations that you thought it was when you first heard it. You don't know what's going to, something could come via TikTok. Something could come from a challenge. Like, to determine what a hit is in this day and age is not that easy. Sorry, I don't care what anybody says. They're lying to you. Um, but that's the fun part, is that challenge. Um, so the pressures of delivering is always going to be there. As an A&R, for anybody looking to get into this business of it, yeah, like, they are hovering over you. Like, the end result of this, you can blame marketing all you want, but... You signed it. That's your vision. So you're the one that's supposed to take this vision that you signed and have everybody fall in line or at least get an understanding of what it is that you saw that's going to make this artist the next Bruno or the next Travis or the next Ed Sheeran or the next, you know, whomever. So, yeah, that's always going to be there. 
It's just how you react to it. Some people are really good, like, they don't fold on the pressure. At least they don't show it. And some people wear pressure on their sleeves, you know? But you would recommend staying present and not too much worry about what's going to happen tomorrow. Stay in the present. Keep in mind about the future. Don't dwell on the past. That's a lesson I've definitely learned, you know, in a variety of ways. You know, I have to have foresight. As an a &R, you have that. That's, to me, the number one quality. It's not just having an ear. It's having foresight. All right, like, you know, I'll come across an artist, like, ah, he's 16. Hasn't really experienced much. His voice might change over the course of the next few. Oh, he's in love with this girl. They're going to break up. So there's some, there's probably a different part of the narrative. How will that affect them? I have to have foresight before I dive into something, you know, that's going to commit company dollars and resources on that, you know, you know, I, that foresight's going to, if I don't have that, then you're winging it. Good luck with that. So... And um, during our break, you were talking about a couple of books that you really looked up to during the course of your career. So what were those books and which ones would you recommend? Yes. Um, the first one, which I was trying to remember early on, is Outliers from Malcolm Gladwell. Really awesome book on the end result of hard work and just really staying true to your craft. You know, it, it falls in line with the, uh, the, the, the theory behind 10,000 hours. Um, 10,000 hours is roughly 10 years Maybe, um, you know, it depends on the kind of mountain work you do. But um, it, I, I believe in that rule. I believe if you just keep honing and working on your craft, you know, uh, an opportunity is going to present itself that's going to allow you to showcase that craft and really get some really next level results. So that's a book I, I definitely recommend for all you hard workers that get to that place where you're frustrated and you don't think it's going to pan out. Take a, take a, you know, take a glance at that book. Um, from a business standpoint, uh, Appetite for Self-Destruction. I don't know. I don't remember the name of the, of the the author's name. It's an awesome book that details how the music business, you know, uh, shifted in the early 2000s uh, from uh, from a digital standpoint. Um, it's like we we basically lost a business during the late aughts, you know, 2007 to the like urban music. Like there was no money being made because no one had adjusted correctly to the times of the digital consumer. And that book gives a great breakdown of the mistakes that were made by the powers that be at that time in not adjusting um, and how Steve Jobs took complete advantage of it uh, with, the, uh, with the iPod and, 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 and you know here we are today with streaming, bringing everything back in a good place where some people call it the, 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 the golden era of, of music now because there's so much money being made. Um, another book, uh, I like, uh, there's two other books I'm going to recommend. One's The Last Mogul, The Story of Lou Wasserman. That's high-level overall moguldom right there. That's not just about one particular, just like this is a story of one mogul who's responsible for a slew of other moguls and the, his plight. And, and, you know, how at one point the company that he had was the most dominant talent agency music company in the world. Uh, very fascinating, very overlooked gentleman, Lou Wasserman. And the other book is uh, The Big Payback, which is the history of hip-hop business. Again, hip-hop is still young, um, so the rules are still being written. And this book does a fascinating job. It's by Dan Charn. It's a former record executive turned writer. And he did a fascinating job at chronologically uh, uh, highlighting some of, the biggest, some of the most impactful business moves that hip-hop has made from back in the 70s all the way till till now times i hope he adds another couple of chapters because it's kind of like the, the game has changed so much since he wrote it and still the information on there is so you know uh pertinent to what's going on now stories on wu-tang jay-z if you've ever wondered why he's considered the greatest hip-hop you know businessman of all time it talks about 360s you know and and, and just fascinating fascinating book I, I think it's like required reading if you're going to rock with me like to me, if you're gonna intern for me, or like you need to read that book. Um, so yeah, those are the four books that I highly recommend for folks. And speaking of interns and recent graduates, uh, it's always been said that like doing your passion is a very rewarding feeling. But for a lot of students or recent graduates, they don't know what their passion is. What would you recommend for people who feel kind of lost right now, especially the younger generation? All right, guys. First off, you're too young to feel lost. All right, like, but I will admit. Uh, things didn't click for me till I was about 18, 19. That's when I, that was the first level of being self-aware where I was like, okay, I need to read a little bit more. 
I need to be around different people. Right? I need to leave my block, you know, because whenever you catch, you know, hang out in the neighborhood or with your group of friends, it's like Groundhog Day. You just keep doing the same thing. So what I would do is, you know, whenever I got a little bit of money, I would just leave, go downtown, and just like really where the culture was at at the time. Um, but then I would come back to home, the hood or whatever, and um, take soak in that part of the culture. But um, you start kind of figuring out there, and then from there you want to figure out early on what it is that you want to do because as I was saying before uh, when we were, you know, off the air, it is a 10-year process. You know, and um, you got to go through your mistakes early. So that way, you know, you readjust uh, and just keep going. And you're going to hit that wall where you start questioning things. But try to do something you're really passionate about. Because at some point, as they say, it doesn't feel like work anymore. I can sit here and tell you I love what I do. It does not feel like work. I earn that. I work myself towards that. But it's still work, but it doesn't feel like work. And um, that was a process that took years. It is achievable for everyone, depending on how driven you are, how focused you are, just how strong you are in your convictions and, and, and working your way towards what you see. I saw myself as an A&R. It took a while to get there, as I was stating. I didn't A&R my first project until six years after getting into the business. I didn't get to fully A&R an Eminem album till 10 years after getting being in the business. And by then, I was so wired to what I thought was best for him that, you know, I was able to contribute and submit things that just made a little sense to him. Even to the point where before I left Shady Records and transitioned to Atlantic, the last record I gave him was Monster, which was his last number one hit. And you kind of knew that this right here could work for the man, you know. Um, so I, I'm wired to understand my artists and understand what it is, but that comes with time. So, um yeah, and I was telling you guys before, I'll never forget my internship days. If you're an intern, any, any of you guys out there um, interning at companies, please make yourself valuable. Don't just sit at that desk and do nothing and wait for people to tell you to do something. Ask, can I help you with anything? Is there anything you need done? I would make the rounds throughout the entire Source magazine. You need anything transcribed? Anybody want some coffee? You know, um, I met some wonderful, wonderful people that I have relationships to this day from that time period because the source itself was an outlet for a lot of very influential people, actors, models, artists, producers. Um, so don't sit there. People, we pay attention to that. We see who the future stars are. And for someone like me who's looking for the next me, I'm watching. And, you know, I pay attention to the folks that, you know, not only myself, but my colleagues as well. One of the first things we ask, like, any good? Yeah, all right, cool. You know, because you want to see who's going to be, who's the next star, because you want to grab onto that star and see, you know, what they can bring to the table. So please do not waste your internship just sitting there and just waiting for things to happen. And quite honestly, you know, shout out to you privileged folks if you are, but I know it's hard, but drive. You can't buy drive. And if you don't have that, then... You know, just um, call it a day and try to do something else. Well, thank you so much for being here today. It's you are been... very welcome. Thank you guys for having me. This is freaking yeah, this awesome. This was a great conversation. Yeah, it was really valuable, especially to most of our listeners who are like recent gradua graduates or still college students. They're still trying to like look out for what to do and like how to follow their passion. So it's been really valuable for us to hear it from you and your experiences. Very cool. Listen, I'm going to throw a challenge out there. I'm not sure if you guys do this already. <laughs> But for anybody out there listening to this, transcribe this interview because I'd love to see it on paper. And whoever transcribes that, you know, send it over to these good folks. They'll send it to me. And I'm, that's, that's, uh, I want to see what you're about because I really enjoyed this interview. I would love to see what it looks like on paper. I don't have time to transcribe. So I'd love to see uh, who the hungry listener is that's able to transcribe this entire interview. Send it in a document and just, you know, let me see what that looks like. Thank you so much for having me, you guys. I really appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Thank you so much.